Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, focusing on the role of digital technology and implant cases. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will cover as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Please make sure that your volume is up and any large computer applications are closed to ensure a smooth connection. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. David Wong. Dr. Wong is a board certified periodontist and is a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology as well as a fellow in the International Congress of Oral Implantologists. Thank you for the time, Dr. Wong. I'll hand it off to you. Thanks so much for the introduction, Adam. I appreciate everybody for taking the time to, to be with us uh, this, this uh, afternoon, I guess is what it is right now. So anyway, it's 12 o'clock Central Time and uh, I'm David Wong. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma in private practice and uh, just proud and honored to be here with you guys today to talk about the role of digital technology in basically implant surgery. So what today is about is going to be what role does digital dentistry play as an implant surgeon? You know, right now there's a lot of technology out there and it's sometimes hard to, to distinguish between what's really necessary and what's not necessary. You know, what's really absolutely important for us to deliver good quality care versus what's just a toy. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm also going to show you just a few cases on, you know, in situations where digital technology has really bailed us out in several cases and made things easier for us and also made things easier for patients. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, real quick, as far as getting in touch with me after this, I know this is just kind of a short webinar. It's only going to be about an hour long. So um, after this, you can contact me through uh, Instagram probably is the easiest way for, for me. I've got two accounts. One is uh, david.wong.dds, which is kind of more of a, a personal uh, type, type account. And then all the surgeries and stuff that if you're interested in seeing more about those, uh, those are on the other account. It's called Plaque China. So feel free to message me. I'm really good about responding uh, there. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is the standard actually when it comes to digital dentistry, when it comes to dental implants? You know, is digital radiography a standard? Is, is a CBCT a standard? Uh, what about you know, surgical guides and digital impressions? So these are kind of the, the four basic categories that we're going to dive into today to really talk about what's important and what is not. So we're going to have to talk about a few key pieces of technology today, and we're going to look at what is exactly the purpose of technology. So if you have a new toy or new product or solution that you're seeking, what is the reason that we're, we're trying to buy this stuff? You know, what's the, what, why are we doing this? You know, hopefully we're trying to do this so that we can improve things for patients and, and make it better. Um, being faster would be really nice to, you know, improve the speed and time the patients are in the chair because the dental chair is not exactly a place that everybody wants to hang out in. What about less expensive? Can we decrease cost of delivery uh, for patients by incorporating more and more technology? So let's look at better, you know, when we talk about better, what do we mean by better? You know, for implants, you know, better would mean, you know, more accurate, you know, I'm placing the implant where I want to place it. Uh, we want it safer. So we're not hitting any vital structures like nerves and sinus cavities and things like that. We want better function. Um, function meaning, uh, you know, the patients, as an example, you know, dentures. You know, we, we can help them to chew, chew their food better, speak better. Want to be comfortable. You know, if they have teeth that are hurting them, maybe we can get them out of pain easier. Finally, health. Can we get them healthier and last a long time? You know, that's, that's the name of the game is longevity. And finally, predictability. Whatever we do for patients, we obviously you know, want to protect their investment for them. You know, we, want them to, we want to be a key player on their team. And as, as a result of that, we want to, things to be predictable. What are the current barriers to adopting technology? One's cost, you know, whenever new things come out, you know, they cost a lot of money, right? So before we just go out and buy every, everything that, that uh, everything that pops up um, on our computer screen, we've got to figure out how much things cost and what our return is. 
time. You know, whenever you incorporate new technology, just look at all the different, you know, COVID-19 um, things that we're doing in our offices now. You know, there's a lot of things that cost money and it takes a lot of time to learn and adopt this technology. There's also a learning curve. You know, sometimes, you know, we may not all be, uh, you know, computer savvy, for instance. So there's, there's often a learning curve uh, that we may or may not be willing to, you know, to pursue. There's also uncertainty and doubt because you buy, you start to buy these things and, and there's always uncertainty and doubt as to whether or not it's, it's going to, you know, even work. Is it, is it going to do what we say it's going to do or how it's advertised it's going to do? Maybe we don't have a perceived need. Yeah, you know, maybe we see all this stuff and, and maybe our neighbors have one and all our colleagues have one, but we don't look at ourselves and go, do we even, do we need that? So if we look classically at the old CBCT images and, and planning software, it looks very, very rudimentary, you know, kind of like this implant software here. It doesn't, you know, the implant is just basically a long rectangle. It doesn't even look like an implant. What if we did it the old fashioned way, you know, to where we just drill halfway down into the osteotomy and take an x-ray to see if we're about to hit a root. And if you're about to hit a root, you know, like you are here, you, you make an adjustment, you know, what's wrong with that doing it analog style. So these are some things, you know, that I know in the implant surgery circles, you know, people debate all the time, you know, what, why do I need that? So there's often a, a big discrepancy, a gap, if you will, between the real need versus the perceived need when it comes to digital technology and implant surgery, you know, specifically placing the implant. Whenever we see cases like this, though, you know, we see cases like this all the time where we have implant failures that have, that have gone south. And then when you open things up, you'll notice that as an example here, I mean, the implants hitting the, hitting the adjacent tooth, you know, certainly, you know, that's not done intentionally. So could, could digital technology have, have helped avoid this? A lot of times we have implants that are placed too far to the facial, or maybe the, the abutment selection is incorrect. But could, it, could di digital dentistry, once again, could it help us in these types of situations? What about this one? Same type thing. These are all cases that I see in my practice all the time, and you probably do too. And you wonder, you know, why did the surgeon put the implant in that position? Are they a, are they a bad doctor, or do they not have the right technology? Or is it both? So these are the types of things that I'm hoping, you know, that whenever as a periodontist, these are the types of cases that I'm hoping to avoid. And I'm not so far, I think I've, I've avoided things like this, but it hasn't always been, oh, it has not always been smooth sailing. So these are the types of cases we're going to be talking about, how to avoid them, how to treat them and that type of thing. So, so even though we're talking about digital, digital dentistry, can't help but be, be a periodontist and a teacher and kind of throw some bone grafting tips and implant surgery cases uh, tips your way as well. So when it comes to situations like this, where we have, you know, six implants in a, in a large edentulous area, you know, how do we get those things lined up? How do we get them spaced out properly? It's not as easy as you might think. So could digital dentistry help us in this situation? You know, right now we have cool little things like, you know, our plan Mecca Pro Max, uh, Pro Max, you know, CBCT does wonders for us and we utilize it every single day, probably every single hour of every single day. Um, it's been a lifesaver for us because no longer do we have to worry about, you know, placing the implant in the right position. All we do is we, we can actually show the patient beforehand where the implants are going. And a lot of the times we can even do a wax up and show them what their teeth are going to look like. Evaluating the need for technology. Now, I can't answer that question for every single person that's on this webinar because we all have a different skill set. We all have a different comfort level. So what is our, our threshold for needing technology? So in this situation, you know, this is a classic case. You know, I talked to this, this dentist about, about this case many times and, you know, about this case. He actually sent this patient to me to correct this implant, uh, not because the implant was placed incorrectly, but because he felt the patient needed, needed a soft tissue graft. So whenever I saw this case, oh, man, I was freaked out. I was like, what are we going to do about this implant? It's sticking way too far out in front. You know, there's no way to really restore this to the patient's satisfaction. I begged and pleaded with the dentist to not restore the case. 
told me to put put the either you know start over with the new implant or put the thing to sleep and do a bridge. And you know what's what's funny is you know he says to me, "Hey, we're just going to restore it because I think you know lucky for us the patient has a low smile line." Well, look at this. I don't think she has a low smile line at all. But what do you do now? You know what do you do in this situation? In this situation, we can't really do a whole lot surgically. You know, it's it's not salvageable unless you do one of the two things. Like I said, we either start over by taking the implant out, or we bury the implant and do a bridge. I told him, you know, hey, let's just let's just kind of punt right now. Let's pull the plug on this thing, and you know, lo and behold, some people just keep pushing forward, and this is what happened. This is how he restored the case, um, and this is the photo that he sent me. Very proud, and this is why you know the photography is a little bit different uh, than what I was showing you very proud you know so we all have a different different degree of, of understanding you know where technology can help us and where it can't okay so I can't make that decision for you so hopefully by the end of today uh, you'll figure out you know what where you know some possibilities and opportunities are for you so let's start off with with for me how I use it digital dentistry and implant immediate implant uh, replacement. So here we have a gentleman who uh, needs tooth number nine extracted. And he has some other dental problems as well, as you can see here. But uh, we're going to start off with number nine. And if we look at here, uh, his case, he's got uh, an implant from number 10. Number eight's a natural tooth. Nine needs to be extracted. And then 10 is, is also questionable as well. But what's neat about this, and, and here what we're doing with our newer software now is we can actually have, we have a whole catalog of all the implants. Uh, systems out there. So when we place our implant uh, virtually like we are here, you can see that this is a BioHorizons implant and it's it's all, you know, anatomically correct. Uh, pretty neat, just a just an aesthetic feature, but, you know, our, our software has come a long way. So at any rate, let's cut to the chase here. If we can actually plan our implant before we take the tooth out, not only can we plan the position of it, we can actually plan exactly the thread timing to where we know exactly to the turn of uh, where that implant is going to stop uh, in the socket here. So we're going to take out tooth number nine. We're going to put the implant in and we're going to use this, use a surgical guide. So here, you know, with BioHorizons and, and uh, BioHorizons and their association with Vulcan Labs is, is, who we, is, is who we typically use. So here we, we're putting our guide in place and then we're just going to put our implant in right through the guide. Very, very simple. Um, very simple, very predictable very accurate. So these are things that improve things for our patients. So now at this point, you know, since we have really good stability, we didn't fiddle around in, in the socket for very long at all. Uh, we're talking about from start to finish, it's about, you know, five to 10 minutes. Now we can actually, you know, take the crown off of, off of the old root, hollow it out and utilize that as his, as his provisional restoration. And that's what you're seeing here. It's going to be a screw retained provisional restoration. Now, on top of that, you know, what we've learned with, with immediate implants is it helps to seal off that gap between the socket and the implant, right? So there's going to be a gap or a discrepancy. So we're going to add some bone around the implant, but we want something to seal it off. Some, some uh, surgeons will use a, a, a collagen membrane or something like that. Um, I always like to use something, you know, like PRF. Here we're using the Intraspin machine from also uh, uh, through BioHorizons. Really nice machine, but what separates it from the membranes is that we're using the patient's own blood, so we're using their own uh, their own byproducts uh, to seal off that graft uh, from the implant. So, really nice natural solution, very inexpensive as well. It's less than ten dollars an application. So, look into this machine if you're looking to you know fabricate your own membranes. Keep in mind, it's not a barrier membrane in the, in the sense that we know about barrier membranes for bone grafting, but it is a nice little seal um, between the provisional and the bone graft underneath. So really, really nice uh, service for the patient. So here we have our bone graft material on the right with the, the PRF membranes that were, that's made from the patient's own blood. And what's, what's neat about it is when you combine the two materials together, you have what we call sticky bone. And this is the bone that I'm just demonstrating here. You turn the turn your spatula upside down and the bone just sticks to it. But anyway, it makes it really, really nice for us to fill in that gap that you can see here on the facial aspect of the implant, fill in that gap with the bone. And then here, uh, what we utilize is, is uh, 
we, we're just puncturing the PRF membrane uh, with the temporary abutment and the temporary crown. And then we're just going to seal that, seal that socket off there. Now, what I like to do is wait a couple months and then we, we uh, take a new CBCT. This is a nice sagittal view. Once again, you can't really evaluate an implant without this type of, without this type of digital technology. You have to have a CBCT. And when you look at this, you can really evaluate your work and see that, no, we did not you know, hit the nasopalatine canal, for instance. We also have a huge amount of facial bone to the facial um, of the implant. So we have lots of bone all around, implants placed in a good position. And then when you look at the patient, it's got a nice uh, healing, uh, nice provision, uh, screw retained uh, provisional restoration. Now, being a periodontist, I don't do the final restoration, but this is a nice service that I can provide to my restorative dentist. So if we look at um, another case, we can do the same exact thing. Uh, this is this is this now gives us an opportunity to add something else, which is soft tissue grafting. Um, so if we look at, at this case here, it's tooth number eight that we're taking out. And you're going to notice that we have some recession on tooth number eight, and we have a marginal discrepancy uh, between the, the gingival margins of number eight and number nine. So how do we handle this? So here we've got a, a CBCT, and you can see the cross-section and the sagittal uh, view here uh, on number eight. You can see that the bone on the facial of number eight is really, really thin. In fact, we may even have you know, a fenestration or a dehiscence in the bone there. So here's her smile line. It's a pretty low smile line. But uh, everything starts off with an atraumatic extraction. So we don't want to damage the interdental papilla. We want to keep the facial plate intact as, as much as possible. And that's what we've done here. So here we've already prefabricated a surgical guide. And we're going to place the implant straight through the guide, just like we did with the previous case. And now we're just going to fabricate a uh, provisional restoration in the mouth using uh, just a, a vacuum form uh, tray here. We're going to adjust that in the mouth. Now, what do we do about that gingival recession that was there? So what, what's cool about all this is with everything being atraumatic, thanks to digital the, the digital dentistry approach, we haven't reflected any flaps or anything like that. So now it makes everything nice and neat. So now what we've done is we grab a piece of, of graft material. This is cadaver material. Okay, This is a soft tissue allograft. This does not come from the patient or the patient's uh, you know, palate or anything like that. But it's nice because that gingival marginal discrepancy that we had between the two central incisors, we can correct that now with the scum graft, bring that down, and now you can see, even though it's been months and months and months since she's been wearing this provisional restoration, you can see that the tissues are practically even you know, between number eight and number nine. So it's a nice way to incorporate um, digital technology, immediate implant placement, immediate provisionalization with the soft tissue graft. So we're doing all this with minimal trauma you know, to the patient. So is this better? Is this faster? Is this more accurate? You know, in these types of situations, it definitely is. Definitely a huge time saver. The thing about digital dentistry for us is it makes surgery, it minimizes the trauma, the morbidity, you know, and decreases the recovery time. So if we look at um, tra traditional surgeries, traditional approaches versus the digital approach, let me just kind of show you. Sometimes we have to mix and match the two because the cases get so complex. So here's just a, a traditional approach here. We have this lady, she has failing teeth, teeth numbers seven, eight, nine, and 10, okay? So when you look here at, at these teeth, right now she has a four unit bridge from seven through 10. So, you know, those, the laterals have to go. The problem is, is that she's had this bridge for so long that she doesn't really have a whole lot of bone in the pontic areas. So finally, you know, what gave way was her bridge finally broke and the teeth broke off at the gum line. And now we're in an emergency situation. So traditionally, we would just take out the teeth, reflect the big flap, and you can see how thin the bone is, even in the areas where seven and 10 were present. We go ahead and augment the, the side, but you see how big of a flap we had to reflect versus the previous cases. Now, four months after the augmentation, you know, traditionally, you would actually have to go back and, and flap everything again to put the implants in. Well, now we don't have to do that. We already did that to her once. We don't want to have to do it to her a second time. So now what we do is we get a CAT scan. 
And once again, these are these are BioHorizons endpoints that we're placing with the with the guide from Vulcan. And then here we go. We have our our implants, and we planned on three of them. But what's neat about this from a digital perspective is instead of flapping everything where we have to see everything with our own eyes, we can now go flapless. Okay, we can go straight through this guide without reflecting a big flap. So that's the case that we're going to show you. Traditionally, though, here we go. We have this big. Well, yeah, we have this big flap, and then we have to temporize her with the flipper. So. What if we didn't have to do it that way, though, right? So how much how much better would it be for patients if they didn't have to keep getting flapped over and over and over again? So that brings us to my good friend here, Janet. Now, Janet truly is a good friend of ours. What happened with her, She, as you can see here, she's missing her upper incisors. What happened in her situation is, is she accidentally got kicked in the face by a horse, literally. Um, she, was take, she took her uh, granddaughter to the stables. And her granddaughter wandered into the horse stable. She ran in after her, startled the horse, kicked her in the face, knocked out her four front teeth. Well, here's the problem. You know, not only does she have missing teeth, if you look at her at the gingiva, it looks terrible. It's in terrible condition. So what, what do we do in this situation? So not only do we have to repair the bone, but we also have to repair the gum tissue. So here, I'm going to flash forward here just for the sake of time, but, um, Let's go ahead and just kind of flash forward here. This the ridge that you see here is two weeks after uh, we've already uh, healed from the bone graft, and now we've already done the gum graft. Okay, so what you're seeing on the right hand side is the day that we took the stitches out from her gum graft. So she's already endured a, a horse kick to the face, some oral surgery to repair the bone, some periodontal surgery to repair the gums. Now she's ready for her implants. So what if we didn't have to flap her? So this is what digital dentistry does for us now. We can actually get a scan of her and we can actually virtually place the implants. So she finds that really cool because she's gone through all this work. She wants to know that this, this is going to work, that the bone grass work before you go and you know put her under again. So we're able to show her where the implants are going to be placed. We're able to do a digital diagnostic wax up to show her roughly what the teeth are going to look like. With that, we make a surgical guide. We've already done all the hard work with the hard and soft tissue on the front end. So now all we have to do is put this guide in and drill straight through it and put in our two implants, as you can see here. When you look at the post-op surgery here, you can see how atraumatic the implant placement is. There's no flap involved. There's very minimal bleeding. The best part for her is that she didn't have to go, you know, be sedated and her surgery time literally was about 15 minutes start to finish. We give it about four months of healing and then we you know, have her dentist. We refer her, her back to her dentist for the final restorations. And here she is, smile back. We're able to get, take her from here to here. Took a few months, but, you know, we were at least able to save her from one big, you know, traumatic event. So in this situation, does a $300, you know, $25 surgical guide help her situation? Absolutely. Worth every single penny. Not only that, it's worth every single penny to me too, because instead of spending an hour on her surgery, we spent about 15 minutes. So it was faster, more accurate, and less painful for the patient. So it's a win-win all around. What about how do we manage failures? So when we manage failures, so in dentistry, if people tell you they haven't had any failures, they just have not done enough cases, right? Or they don't, or they don't work. So here we've had, a, we have a case where we have a, a sweet, sweet lady, number nine and 10 have to be extracted. As you can see here, lucky that more teeth didn't have to be extracted. But here's the thing. She's got this gigantic abscess, right? So when we took out this teeth, with these teeth, you can see how big of a defect, you know, came out of that, came out of those sockets. Uh, so we had to grow the bone. So this is our bone graft material here. And the way we teach our bone grafting is just like anything else. We have to graft the socket. We have to graft around the socket. So we're uh, incorporating a couple of pieces of uh, principles of bone growth, which is barrier by bulk, where we bulk out all the bone. And then we're going to add our membrane that I talked about earlier, earlier, the collagen membrane, and then we're going to cover it with that PRF membrane that I introduced to you right off the bat. So we close everything up, and everything's looking great, but three months later, 
we take an x-ray, what happens? All the bone, it disappears. Where'd all the bone go? You know, it turns out she had such a huge infection and she was such a tough lady, she never even knew it. She lost the bone graft, never even knew it. So we look at this, we just wait, and we wait, and we wait, we wait six months. And this is what she looks like. And I hate, I hated to break it to her, but we have to do this again. Is it normal to have to do another bone graft? Well, whenever we look at, you know, some of the papers from some of the work from my good friend, Dr. Bach Lee, utilizing this, his screw tentpole technique uh, that I'm going to show you here. Yes, you on occasion have to have to re regraft. But here's the problem in her situation. Is look how big that defect is. It's huge. Okay, look at where the CEJ of the adjacent teeth are uh, compared to uh, where, where the crest of the bone is for number nine and 10. So here we're utilizing the tent poles, uh, the tent screws as our tent poles. That's going to help support our bone graft material. It's gonna help us provide space maintenance and stability for our graft. So here we've placed our two, our, our bone graft material uh, and then we're covering it with our membranes again. We went ahead and skipped on the PRF this time around. She wasn't prepared to do that. So here we go, growing more bone again. Here we are at two weeks. We can see that the, you know, we have some scar lines and things like that. Fortunately for her, she's not overly concerned with aesthetics. But at the end of the day, what we're able to do is rather than put her through another traumatic surgery, once again, we can, we can look at this and, and plan out everything. Okay, we, we can plan where our, our implants are going to go. But not only that, I'm going to show you one other thing we can do. With our implants going to be having to be buried so far apically, we're going to have a hard time finding a, a proper size healing cap. Well, that's where digital comes in again. So what we do is we can actually send the scanning file over to our Vulcan lab that we like to use. And what they do is they custom make us a healing cap that looks, that will have the right height and the right contour for us. So let's see how that works. So here, implant the, uh, the tenting screws have to come out, but the implant goes in through this guide. So once again, even though it's a complex situation, we can actually put this implant in pretty quickly. Here we're utilizing a uh, BioHorizons uh, tapered internal uh, plus implant. Implant's going in. And what's cool about it is, there you go, that healing cap. So you won't see anything else like it. It's really, really neat. It's made out of metal, so it's not that plasticky, you know, peak material or anything like that. This is a, a metal uh, custom healing cap. So and it fits just perfect because remember how deep that implant was. We needed something that, that was this tall, and it gave it the right shape for a central incisor. Here we've given it a few months, and now we're just, we got her in her temporary. And you can see here, even when she's just graining as big as she can, she can't even show the gum line at all. So uh, we've turned a bad situation and made it just a little bit better. Not perfect, but it's just a little bit better and we didn't have to. And you can see she's she's happy and satisfied considering how, how bad her situation could have been. What about full arches? So when we talk about full arches, what's really neat about full arches is, you know, patients have, have teeth that have been missing, right? And uh, when the teeth have been missing, the jaws go undergo some dramatic changes at times. But not only that, sometimes the jaw bone undergoes dramatic changes different than what the soft tissue was like. So whenever we start treatment planning full arches, it's really important, especially if you're a specialist uh, who doesn't do restorative. So if you're a periodontist like me or perhaps an oral surgeon, it's really important to be on the same page as the restoring doctor. And so what I like to do is I like to meet with my restorative dentist in this, in this situation was Dr. Joe Massad. Uh, you may have seen him on the cover of dentistry today a few times, but what, what Joe and I like to do is it was, we like to sit together and, and he shows me where he thinks the implants. I tell him where I think I can put the implants. He tells me if it's in, 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 in an acceptable restorative position. So what's neat about this is whenever we sit down and Joe will put the implants in on the ridge, right? And then I'll, whenever I flap it open, I'll find that, you know, where he wants the implants is way different than where the bone actually is sometimes. So we have to plan all this. We don't want to get into a, a situation where we have to do additional bone grafting uh, for the patients unexpectedly 
or worse yet, not be able to put the implant in at all. So a lot of times there is a, a difference between expectation versus reality. So for example, on the top here, you can see where Joe put the implants in right over the ridge. But as soon as I flapped it and put the implants in, the implants are actually, some of them are quite a bit to the lingual of that ridge, which is totally unexpected. A surgeon would typically just put the implants in the middle of the bone, you know, which makes sense to us. But what makes sense to us doesn't always make sense restoratively. So it's really important that we work together. When we transition people, a lot of times when we transition people from teeth to no teeth, um, that can be a challenge too, because they, they, a lot of times they'll need some additional bone grafting. So this is a classic case of that. So this gentleman had some hopeless remaining teeth in the maxilla. We took out what he had left, but we had to, we had to augment the anterior portion because we needed some implants there. So here you can see how thin his maxillary, his, uh, his uh, pre-maxilla is, a uh, very, very thin ridge. So we went ahead and did our cortical perforations to get the butt get the blood flowing in that area. And then we add our bone graft material. Uh, sometimes we use a xenograft, sometimes we use an allograft, sometimes we co combine the two. And then sometimes we sprinkle in a little bit of autogenous bone as well. But the whole point of it is, is we gotta augment this, this site. So here's our collagen membranes covering everything. And here we are, okay, this, we're all sutured up and now this patient is gonna go into a denture for, for a couple months. So. After a couple months, we, we go back in. And once again, it's really important now that he has a nice ridge and a denture that fits pretty decently. The last thing we want to do is go back in and flap everything open again and have everything not fitting in. So it's really nice to go through and you know, we, we get our, our patient in our plan Mecca Pro Max, get our CAT scan. From the CAT scan, we order, we order a nice static guide here. And then we just secure it to the jaw. And we just drill straight through the holes here. You know, very, very simple. Here we've got six implants, and as you can see here with our CBCT that we can evaluate the bone on all the way around each implant. And you can see our bone grafts work beautifully, and they're in a really good position in the mouth. And now we have a really happy patient who has fixed teeth. He got to throw away his denture. He doesn't have any plastic or anything covering the roof of his mouth. It's altering the taste of his food. Everything's just looking really, really good, and he's super happy. What are some additional benefits of surgical guides? So in addition to um, being able to put the implants in the proper position, uh, it also en enables us to do flapless surgery sometimes. It's really important sometimes for us to sometimes reduce the bone. So instead of drawing bone, we sometimes have to reduce it because we have too much. So how do we know how much to reduce though? I mean, do we just eyeball it? We used to, you know, we used to just get a ruler and just measure how much we needed to reduce it. And we would just, you know, reduce the bone. But let me show you something a little bit easier. So here we have a, a young lady here. We've got three missing teeth, I mean, three teeth remaining and they're about to be pulled out. But you can see how thin that ridge is. So rather than, you know, grow bone on that very thin ridge, we met with the restorative dentist he says, no, 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 no. We don't need any to grow any bone. We actually need to reduce it to get us some restorative space. So here the teeth are out. But now when you look at this, you know, you don't have any more landmarks. You can get disoriented really easily, right? You can level the bone, but what if you level it kind of at a cant or whatever? You know, maybe it's not all even. So how do you how do you make sure that you do a solid job? So with our CBCT. Uh, once again, I, I like to, we have a we have the Plan Mecca in our office. I like Plan Mecca products. I've been with them for a long time, uh, eleven years to be exact. So I like them. But anyway, with our CBCT, we can fabricate, uh, communicate with our lab, and fabricate a reduction guide. So instead of a guide that helps us put us put our implants in place, this is a reduction guide. So we put we screw this into the lower uh, lower jaw, and pretty easy at this point. You just grab your burr and you remove anything coronal uh, to that guide. And that's what it looks like when you're done. So you have a nice little template that's accurate. And not only that, it's gonna be safe for the, safer for the patient, more accurate, higher quality, better fit, and your restorative dentist is going to get exactly what they asked from you. So here are our, our BioHorizons implants going in place. We went ahead with our posterior ones being angled. 
So this is our all on four uh, type approach. And this is how, once again, how digital dentistry can make our lives so much easier. So the next question people have is, hey, you know, I've heard you talking about these surgical guides a whole lot. What if, what if I made my own surgical guide? Well, you could make your own. You absolutely could. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But, you know, when we look at, about at surgical guides, you know, how do we quantify how much time we're actually saving? When we look at surgical time versus prosthetic time, you know, you're saving 20% on 20% time on the surgical time and then 40% on the prosthetics. So you, you save a whole lot of time. You know, I know it only seems like with nine minutes on the surgery and 14 minutes or so on the, on the prosthetics, but all those little, all those things add up, add up to a lot, actually. So it's faster when you do guided and it's more accurate. So the question is, why not print your own guide? I don't want to pay the lab to do that anymore. Like you said, you had to do you know, the lab, you know, you have a lab fee, you have to mail it, you have to wait on them to do their thing and mail it back to you. So why not print your own? So there's no right or wrong answer to this, but I will say this, the do-it-yourself guides are pretty accurate. They do a really good job and you can buy the components, the sleeves and things that fit your implant system just perfectly. But here's the problem for me, for me and anyone. Whenever we talk, look at the time to do it yourself, this is an article from Whitney in 2017. So things have changed quite a bit in, in print times. Um, but in 2017, when I first started looking into this, you know, the average time to do it yourself, to print a guide was about four hours. I just didn't have time to do that. Not only that, we have a small boutique type practice to where we don't even have this, the manpower. Uh, I don't have the assistance that could, I could even train to do that because they're busy doing other things. So going to our last bit here for the last 20 minutes, we're going to talk about digital impressions and soft tissue development. So let's look at this. So here we have a gentleman who has number 10 that's hopeless. We have a, a big through and through uh, defect goes from facial all the way to the lingual. And here's this CAT scan that you can see here. So based on the principles of bone grafting, we have to flap everything open. We need to thoroughly clean out the defect. We're going to use uh, a human allograft here. We're using mineralized cortical bone, and then we're going to cover it with a bovine collagen membrane. Like you can see here, we're going to get primary closure. So those satisfy the principles of bone grafting, which is having a clean surface, having a stable bone graft, space maintained, and proper suturing. Okay, those are the with the four basic tenets of, of bone grafting here. So at two weeks, you can see everything's healing up very nicely. So six months later, we can now look at a new CAD scan to see how much bone we have. You can see that the defect is filled up quite nicely. You can also see on the left side of your screen on the lingual, if you pay attention, there's there's a there's a uh, still a little bit of a defect there because I forgot to put a membrane on the lingual aspect. So we got a little bit of ep epithelial inclusion there. So at any rate, we were able to place our implant for tooth number 10. You can see the, the large mass of bone that we have for the number 10 position. Now, here's, here's what the problem was in the old days with the old digital scanners is that you had to have that powder. And that powder just kind of got everywhere. It was messy. You needed a dry field. And how do you have a dry field when you just got done doing surgery? So that was always kind of a, a challenge. But the other challenge that we had too was there was really no way to like stitch images and stuff together, you know, or it was very cumbersome. So you always had these scan bodies that would capture the implant position for you, but it couldn't really capture the soft tissue contour. So what would happen is whenever you came time to deliver your crown, like you can see here in the middle picture, you know, the, the abutment or the abutment and the crown would just blanch the tissue a whole lot. And that would could sometimes lead to you know gingival recession around your brand new implant crown if the patient's soft tissue wasn't the right type of biotype. So that was always a challenge, especially at the delivery, because it would hurt. You'd have to anesthetize your patients and able to to uh, deliver that abutment and or abutment and crown. So as a result of that, I ditched digital <laughs> digital scanners for a long time because I was like, that's not really helping me at all. It takes more time to take a digital impression, you know, back, you know, what, five, six, seven years ago, it took more time. It was messy. I had more things to buy. 
occupied more space. It was less reliable because things would go out and not work. Uh, but on top of that, I couldn't do what I wanted to do um, digitally that I could, you know, by hand, freehand. Um, you know, we didn't want any more of those painful appointments for the patients at delivery. So we chose to go back to the old school way of doing it, which is like this. So here we have tooth number nine that we we're extracting. You can see in the cross section that it's not really a great candidate for an immediate implant because of the way the, the shape of, of the maxilla. But at any rate, we went and took the tooth out, grafted all the bone, uh, made it nice and wide and plump. So where four months later, we can utilize a surgical guide to go flapless with our implant surgery. And uh, this is um, here we've got the implant in place. You can see no flap was, was made because we used a surgical guide. I don't ever recommend, recommend going flapless with your implant surgery without a guide because otherwise you're just kind of flying blind here. So after the implants healed, we provisionalize it. Now the key always is with the provisional off, you have this beautiful soft tissue. As soon as you put your impression coping on and take the impression, that soft tissue wants to shrink up right up against the impression coping. And once you, once that happens, you don't have an accurate impression anymore. And if you don't have an accurate impression, that's when the tissue is going to start to blanch and things like that whenever you deliver the crown. So how do we capture this soft tissue? Now, when you do it the old school way, it's really easy. You just take off your, your provisional crown and you stick it on an analog, which is um, encased in stone, okay? In, in stone in a medicine cup. So when my, when my assistants have spare time, I have them put analogs of very common implant sizes into this medicine cup. And that's what we use to make a custom impression coping. So let me show you how that will walk you through that real quickly. So you take the provisional restoration off of your patients, off the, off of the patient, and you're going to screw it onto this analog that's in the stone. Okay. And then you just take an impression of the apical portion or the cervical portion of that crown, okay? That's pretty easy. And then after the impression material sets, you take the crown off, and then on the right side of your screen here, you'll notice that we put the impression coping in its place, and then the void that's left between the impression of the crown and your impression coping, you'll just fill that void with flowable composite, okay? After the composite sets, you take it off and you have a nice, custom impression coping, as you can see here. So put that in the mouth, it's going to capture the soft tissue perfectly. So here you're seeing that the impression material is uh, being flowed around the coping. We're gonna take that off, put the impression coping back into the impression, send it to the lab. The lab is going to pour up a now accurate model. So now you can see that that looks just like the contours of a central incisor that we that you see here. So now, whenever you deliver your crown, it's just going to drop right in. There's not, not going to be any blanching, no need for any anesthesia or anything. So that's the old school way of doing it. Now, we would come to the point in 2020 where we can do exactly what I just showed you in freehand, but now we can do it digitally. So that is a game changer for us. So um, to finish that case, I always take a CAT scan postoperatively, by the way, just to show that we've got plenty of bone to the facial and that everything worked out just fine. We avoided the incisive canal and whatnot. So how do we capture the gingiva digitally? Now, this is, this is where it's, it's a game changer for specialists. So here we've got tooth number nine um, that we're going to take out. Um, we're going to utilize the crown to provisionalize the immediate implant, okay? So what we do in a situation like this, implant is placed. Now we've temporized the implant with his own crown. And then we're gonna add a soft tissue graft like I showed you earlier. So now we get to this point where we have a nice provisional restoration. The soft tissues have healed beautifully. Everything's perfect, right? And now, now's the time to not drop the ball at the one yard line. How do we capture the soft tissue now. 
So at, don't ask me why this patient happens to be my neighbor. Don't ask why he's got his provisional on for three years. It's kind of a long story, but anyway, he did. But fortunately he's, he's got um, good bone around his implant. So this is exactly what I'm talking about though. If you put this implant analog onto your implant and just try to take a traditional impression, the soft tissues will tend to collapse unless you make a custom impression coping. So how do we do this digitally? So what's neat about this now, um, I use the Plan Mecca Emerald scanner. Um, it just sits on, you know, it's, it's on a laptop, small wand, just plugs into your USB port and just sits on, on our 12 o'clock units. Um, very nice and tidy. So anyway, it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. But anyway, the reason why, why we like it, it scans reasonably fast and accurately. But what we do is we, before we take the, uh, the provisional off, we do a gingival mask scan. And then all we do is we erase the provisional restoration. And then we screw the scan body on to where all we now have to do is scan the scan body only. And then we just stitch the two images together. And now by doing that, you have a nice accurate impression. So we're capturing the, the beauty of the, of the uh, provisional restoration just perfectly digitally now without having to go through all those other steps, you know, with the stone and the medicine cup and the analog stuck in there and all that, even though that's, an, that's a pretty easy way to do it. So here's our restoration, final restoration that drops right in. Just a nice, simple way to do this uh, with our Plan Mecca Emerald uh, scanner there. Now, this is just a short video just to kind of show us um, how far we've come here. So, you know, with di just to kind of summarize things, if we wanted to, if the patient has a broken tooth or teeth, we can actually get together with our restorative dentist and fabricate a surgical guide to where we can actually take the teeth out put the implants in at the same exact time. And then not only that, if we want to have a provisional restoration ready, we can. If we don't want to, we can even take the impression at the time of the, at the implant surgery um, so that it can be ready um, upon implant uncovering. So it just gives us a lot of different options here. So in this situation, we actually put the scan bodies on and scanned him the day that the implants were um, placed. Then we covered everything up, but as soon as we uncovered him, we already had his, his uh, bridge ready to go, and it's screwed in the same day. So it saves an appointment. Once again, very, very accurate. But the problem with these things is whenever, we, whenever I say the good and bad of digital, of digital technology is you know, it, a lot of this depends on things like implant stability. You know, what happens if if you plan, go through all this planning and then you can't get your implant stable and you have, kind of have to kick the whole thing out the, out the door. Um, so there are things that are bad about digital technology because especially if you incorporate a lab and have everything prefabricated um, and the surgery doesn't go as planned. So there is some risk there. So you want to make sure that you that case selection is, is good, okay? You wanna make sure that you, you choose a really good, nice slam dunk case especially in the early going, because you can waste a lot. Once again, you can waste a lot of lab bills and components and buying components and stuff uh, that you can't use again. So anyway, just pick your cases uh, wisely. The last thing I want to talk about are dynamic guides. So, so far, what I've shown you when it comes to surgical guides is, is what we call static guides. They, they are static. They stay in your mouth, right? And you drill through the guide. Um, dynamic guides are different. And it addresses some things that a static guide does not. So what a, a dynamic guide is, it's a 3D a guide, but it's in real time. So basically what it is, is it's based on more or less a, uh, a GPS type system that tracks your handpiece uh, relative to the patient's mouth. So you know exactly where you are in the patient's mouth at all times. So it's a, na it's a navigating tool that tells you whether or not you are aligned with your target, okay? It gives you real-time feedback and you can change it on demand. This is really important uh, relative to the old static, to the static guides that I showed you because with static guides, especially on posterior teeth, 
patients may not be able to open up big enough to get a guide and a drill back there. Okay, so this is nice because you don't have to drill through a guide. On top of that, um, if you decide, you know, with a static guide that you know halfway through, you feel like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's not in the exact position that you want it. Well, with a static guide, you're stuck because it's it's already fabricated. With a dynamic guide, you can change the plan on a dime and and make any adjustments as necessary. So. Patients love it because they can actually watch the screen and see whether or not their surgeon's doing a good job or not. So for our dynamic guides, we, I use a system called the X guide. Uh, it's from XNAV. Uh, but anyway, I'll skip through all some of this stuff because what I want to show you is that it can, it can also help us do things like internal sinus lifts, which is what I'm doing here. As you're approaching the sinus, it tells you exactly where you're about to hit the sinus. And then you'll notice on the, on the screen here, you have a big X, right? A big green X. You just line your implant and drill up with the middle of that X. And that's how you know you're going in the right direction. At the top of your screen, you'll see, you know, it tells you how deep you are and how, and what your angle is, how far off angle you may be. So this is exactly what I'm talking about here. Uh, all you do is you line your uh, implant uh, head to the X and it tells you exactly how far off angle you are. And then you'll notice that that red circle is, well, the circle is red. As soon as you reach the depth that you want, it'll turn uh, green. So, and it'll also beep at you. I've got the volume turned down, so it's not gonna beep, beep at you here, but um, as soon as you hit your, your depth that you tell it to, it will turn, uh, it will turn colors and beep at you. So you know that you, you've hit your uh, target. From an ergonomics perspective, it's definitely a change as well. So no longer are you staring into the patient's mouth. You're actually doing your surgery looking at the screen. So your back is a lot straighter. You're not hunched over. You're not twerking your neck around. Ergonomically, it, it is better. So here's just an example of, of us utilizing the X-NAV or X-Guide um, to perform a sinus lift with the simultaneous implant placement. So here we we're utilizing it. So instead of like going by feel and using mallets and things like that uh, to bump up the sinus, uh, we can actually incorporate you know, our, our uh, navigation system to make sure that we know where we are uh, relative to the sinus floor and we can bump it accordingly. So our last case here, we're going to talk about dynamic guides and immediate tooth replacement. So here we've got tooth number 13. From the facial, tooth number 13 looks great, but from the lingual, as you can see here, you can see that the lingual cusp is fractured off well below the gingival margin and the tooth is hopeless. So what we're doing here is uh, we're going to put our, we, we, you do a CAT scan, so it works with any CAT scan. So our, uh, our XNAV is, is hooked up with our Plan Mecca uh, uh, CBCT. So all we do is we import into our X guide, the file from our plan mecca, okay? And then all we do is it has its own software. So we're going to just place our implant for tooth number 13. We're gonna evaluate to make sure we have enough bone. And then once that happens, we can utilize the X guide to place the implant in the perfect position for us. And then on top of that, we'll, we can, uh, we we'll already have a vacuum form model or a trade to, to where we can put a temporary abutment on and go ahead and fabricate a custom healing abutment, or we can fabricate a custom uh, provisional restoration, whichever two you like. At that point, you know, we just let that heal up and then we just swap out crowns to the final restoration, as you can see here. Soft tissue contours, everything looks pretty ideal. Uh, relative to what where she started, tissues are nice and pink and healthy. And on top of that, it was very simple and atraumatic for the patient. You know, we had an extraction with no flap, had an implant with a bone graft and everything at the same time. The provisional was delivered the same day. And then the final restoration, you know, as far as she's concerned, it's the same thing, it's just a different material. So it felt and, and performed and functioned the same as her temporary crown. So with that, um, looks like we're approaching one hour time here. So uh, what is the purpose of technology to kind of sum things up? 
is it better, faster, or less expensive? You know, it can be all three, right? But there's always going to be people who say, you know what, you know, when I practiced in the 80s or 90s, you know, I placed implants in the perfect position anyway. So it's not any better. And some people will say, you know, doing all this scanning business and all this other stuff and utilizing a lab and, you know, making the guides, it's actually slowing me down. You know, I can actually be done in an implant surgery freehand faster. Sometimes I can't argue with that. And then, of course, you know, technology, less expensive. You know, those guides, they, they, they cost money. You know, having those um, appointments to fabricate the guides and incorporate technology, it, it, it costs money. And not only does it cost money, it costs time. And, and in a dental office, as we all know, time is money. So there is some debate on whether or not, you know, some of this technology is better, faster, or less expensive. For me, I've done this long enough and with practice and actually implementing the, the uh, actually implementing the systems into our office, it is better, it is faster, and it is less expensive. But there is a curve. Okay, you are going to go through some growing pains at first. But above all else, you know, if it's not better or faster or less expensive for you, I can tell you, when we look at technology and when we're communicating with our patients and our referring doctors, it provides better communication. Um, and this, is, since we live in, in such an information driven age, better communication is important. Okay, it's what, it's what uh, shows people you know, how, how to, you know, what their situation's like. It helps them understand their situation better. It helps to understand treatment better. And also, also helps to evaluate results and gives us feedback and also helps us, you know, improve things for the future. So above all else, digital technology, especially in implant surgery, it's here to stay. Um, it definitely gives everybody a better understanding of implants where they may have had zero understanding before. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with that thought. One of my favorite quotes, which is, I not only use all of the brains that I have, but all that I can borrow. This is from President Woodrow Wilson. I always carry this with me. I, I really uh, enjoy this quote. And uh, once again, if you have any questions or any comments, hit me up on Instagram. I'll, I'm there to uh, follow up and reply all the time. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. Once again, thank you for your attention. But thank you everyone for attending today's presentation. As a thank you for attending, we will be sending out a link of today's recording in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine, thanks again to Dr. Wong and thanks to all of you for attending. Have a great day. Thank you.